Hello, my name is Dr. Pamela Larde, and this is The Joy Whisperer, where we explore the practice and the science of joy. Now, I'm really excited about talking about joy and about this show because it is one of the things that I have been very particular about embodying into the course of my life through various experiences and various phases of my life. I have conversations around joy with people on social media all the time, especially this week. Um, leading into the show. And there have been so many different perspectives around joy, from joy is happiness versus joy is not happiness, um, more perspectives um, that are influenced by spirituality, like the joy of the Lord is my strength, um, as well as some perspectives from positive psychologists who really dig deeply into the science and, and the, the, you know, the nuts and bolts of what joy really is. And so what I love about this show is that we're going to have an opportunity to honor really all of those perspectives and, and look at how joy plays out from a personal perspective, from a spiritual perspective, as well as some of the science that we see out there um, around emotion and joy and so forth. So I am really excited um, about having these conversations. So let's go ahead and get right into it. So today's truth, number one, is around this idea of what is joy? Let's get clear on what joy actually is. Is it happiness? Is it, um, you know, an emotion? Well, it's all of those things. So, so yes, happiness is, you know, a surface kind of thing. It's, it happens based on what we're experiencing. But joy is something that happens regardless of the event or the situation. It's something that we're able to, you know, to draw from no matter what's happening. And so the way that I like to define joy is by understanding it from four different perspectives. So we have the emotion of joy, we have the expression of joy, we have joy as a state of being, and joy as an experience. So if you look at that, it's really not just saying joy is an emotion, it's just something that we feel, um, but it is also an expression. And what I really love about this idea of joy being an expression um, is because there are so many different ways that that plays out for different people. For some people, they express their joy by laughing or dancing or screaming or, you know, any kind of outburst by embracing somebody who's in their presence. But it's this, it's this embodiment of how we express the joy that exists inside. So that's one aspect of joy. Another aspect of joy is joy as just a state of being. Whether or not there's any expression happening, it is just what you are feeling and what you are experiencing internally. And so a lot of, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about gratitude and, and how gratitude can feed joy, probably to, to the point where people are sick of hearing about gratitude. But that is one of the examples of how we can embody a state of joy um, when we are all by ourselves, perhaps driving in the car, um, appreciating the scenery, appreciating the levels of health that we're experiencing, it is being in a state of joy. Joy is also, um, another element of it, is an experience. And so, yes, we may have uh, you know, ways of expressing our joy. We may embody a state of joy. But joy is also an experience. It is something that we are living through. It is the actual, um, you know, personal, you know, we're bringing in the joy and we are living out the joy. It's that experience of joy. And so those are, those are the manifestations and, and bringing those together is what makes, you know, the definition of joy. It's that experience it's that um, expression, it's that state of being, and of course, it's that emotion that we always talk about. We always see joy as an emotion. We've just lived through probably the most uncertain two years that we have ever experienced. So I am sure that we have had a mix of emotions that we've experienced through that time, whether that is anger, um, you know, perhaps looking at some of the events that have happened on TV, um, that have happened in real life, um, but some of those experiences with the, the social injustices 
the social unrest that is a result of those injustices, some of the things that we have been pushing for. Yes, those things will make us angry. Those things will make us um, have levels of anxiety and fear. So can joy exist while these other emotions are you know, at play? Absolutely. So by no means is this idea of joy intended to cover some of the other very real emotions and experiences that we have. Yes, we can be angry. Yes, we can have fear because this is a part of what it means to be human, having a human experience. So where does joy come in when, you know, when we're having these experiences of anger, these experiences that are not necessarily preferred? Joy, in fact, is the fuel to lift us up when we are feeling what we are feeling. So we acknowledge the anger because if we ignore the anger, there is, we, we're less likely to do anything about it. We acknowledge that the sadness is there because there certainly has been elements of sadness considering the pandemic and, and some of the other things that we have seen over the last two years. So we acknowledge that and we honor that. And when we are ready to take action, when we're ready to um, you know, take a break from the morning, when we're ready to take a break from the anger, or when we're ready to channel that anger into action, we use our joy as the fuel to do exactly that. So we are gonna talk about what it looks like when joy is stifled and how we can overcome the stifling of that joy. So stay with us, We've got lots more for you on The Joy Whisperer. We are talking about truths, when we return, we'll continue the conversation around stifling our joy and look at the fact that a lot of people don't experience joy at all. So what stifles our joy? What stifles our joy is when one of those four manifestations have been blocked in some way, shape or form. So for example, if you are in a relationship and that relationship is not one that really supports, you know, your partner doesn't really support um, extreme emotion or expression and so forth, um, your expression can actually be stifled. And I've, I have experienced this and I have seen this happen in, in other relationships. I have come home over the moon excited and I share that with the person I'm in a relationship with and their response is, yeah, I need you to calm down a little bit, or that's a bit much, or don't you think you're a little over the top? That is stifling joy expression. And when that happens, it also inherently in stifles it, or it stifles our joy. So think about that as it pertains to the other four manifestations. What happens when our emotion around joy is stifled? When this is what happens when we numb ourselves, Brene Brown speaks to the idea of numbing ourselves to extreme emotions that we are really kind of afraid of. And what she says is that when we numb one kind of emotion, we really numb all of our emotions. So what happens when we numb our joy, for example, and the emotion around joy, we also make it difficult for us to experience other kinds of emotions. So in doing that, we are stifling our joy. And a lot of times, you know, why would anybody numb a certain emotion? It might not intentionally be the positive emotions we're trying to numb. In fact, we may be so adverse to our own anger, our own sadness, um, and some of those other emotions that we call negative um, that are in fact not negative at all. They are signals that help us to understand what we need to pay attention to. Well, when we ignore those uncomfortable signals, what we do is we also ignore and numb those other um, more positive emotions that we are you know, more excited about having. So it's really important for us to recognize if we have fallen into the habit of numbing certain emotions, um, watering down our reactions and you know to certain situations um, because what this does is it stifles our joy. So we numb our expression 
we numb our emotions and those are two things that stifle the joy. Now let's look at state of joy. And, you know, this sounds very Pollyannish, right? You know, we're walking around and we're feeling the, the joy and we're seeing the roses and the, you know, the birds and all of that. And, and while that may sound, you know, a little over the top and a bit exaggerated in terms of how we may walk around in life, especially considering the landscape of what we're experiencing nowadays, all of those things um, can make it really difficult to walk around in a state of joy. But when we are not intentional about being in a state of joy, surrounding ourselves with people who are joyful, who are positive, who know how to take uh, situations that may be not so great or uncertain and turn those into experiences of, of joy and turn those into experiences that fuel us with the energy that we need to move forward. How do we create joyful experiences um, among the people that we love when we're by ourselves. Let me tell you, I am one who, if you ever had a camera inside my house and I'm home alone, you will see me dancing around the living room. You will see me singing at the top of my lungs, turning on karaoke. The things that I do in public um, to, to create joy are exactly the same things I do by myself to create joy. You want to make sure that you are engaging in joyful emotion, that you are allowing for that joyful emotion and that you're not so afraid of those other less pleasant emotions that you inadvertently stifle your joyful emotion. Remember that in order to create joy, to prevent your joy from being stifling, you've got to engage in joyful expression. Be willing to surround yourself with people who welcome your joyful expression. If that means screaming at the top of your lungs, if that means throwing your arms around somebody that you love and care about, if that means jumping and dancing at receiving wonderful news, be willing to engage in that joyful expression. Now that doesn't always come naturally for people. There are, you know, people who are very naturally reserved and who might feel a bit embarrassed to go too deep into their expression. And everybody doesn't have to express their joy in the same way. But if you find what works for you, if you find the joyful expression that resonates with who you are, then you are then creating your own joy. So even if that means I needed to sit down and write it out, and, and the writing is your expression of joy, that is totally okay. What's important is that you figure out what it is for you. I think that joy isn't a zero sum game. So when you're experiencing joy, you're not taking joy away from anyone else. And I think it's important to remember that joy serves a purpose and it has a ripple effect. So when you're joyful, it, that can cast out onto others, your children, family, friends, etc. Today's whisper in my ear, the question of the day, comes to me from social media. And that question is, how do we know when a relationship has run its course? How do we know when a red flag is actually a red flag? Or if it's just something that we should work with? That answer coming up on The Joy Whisperer. How do you know when a professional relationship or partnership has run its course? I know when it feels like work. Mm. That's how I know it's run its course. When it's hard to be with them, I know it's run its course in that time frame. And it's okay. So today's whisper in my ear, the question of the day is, how do I know when a relationship has run its course? How do I know when a red flag is actually a red flag and not just some kind of behavior that I need to learn to adjust to? There is not one universal answer to that question. It really depends on our own uh, baseline and our own expectations for relationships. Um, and, and the decision that we want to make accordingly. Now, for example, I have spent probably the last, um, I don't know, a few years really focusing in on the things that bring joy to my life. What brings peace to my life? And as a single person, I think I've got a pretty good handle on what it is that I, you know, that works for me. So when I enter into a relationship or when I'm engaging with colleagues or family members, you know, whoever it is, I think it's important for me to establish that baseline of peace and joy that I've already established for myself. 
That's my baseline. That's the barometer I use to determine whether or not a relationship is something that I want to continue on with. It literally is a choice. So when you think about it, if somebody comes into your life and you already have an established level of peace, an established level of joy that you're experiencing your life in your life, and they bring that down, that's a telling you know, experience about whether or not you want to continue to have somebody in your life who brings your joy down. Now, of course, you're going to have moments in which joy is just not always there. This is just the nature of human interaction. You're going to have moments where your peace is disrupted. What's important for you to think about is whether or not these are moments or whether or not this has become the momentum of your relationship. If it's become the momentum of your relationship, you really might want to rethink whether or not this is the momentum that you want to maintain. This can be uh, you know, having a conversation with the person about what the dynamic is doing to your joy and peace. If they're receptive, maybe there's some work that can be done. If there's not any reception, if they're not receptive to it, then for me, that would be a pretty telltale sign that this is probably a relationship that has run its course. And then, of course, there are situations where the two of you do try and, you know, and push and push and try to create the kind of relationship that is most ideal for you. But if even in doing that, it becomes evident that the momentum is one that pulls down your joy and pulls down your peace, it's really worth considering that this may not be the ideal situation and that the relationship has indeed run its course. It's not always fun to accept that reality, but it's going to be something that's really important for you to be able to maintain your own joy, to be able to pursue your purpose, um, and to be, continue to, to create those kinds of experiences that are going to propel you forward as opposed to pulling you down. So how do you know when a relationship is presenting red flags? Red flags, again, are those things that I think can be signaled through our emotions. And so if our emotions are being peaked in ways that bring down our joy, that stifle our peace, uh, it's important to pay attention to those. It doesn't automatically mean that, you know what, this isn't it for me, but it could be a signal that this is something I need to pay attention to. So I have had situations where I am ready to embark on something new. I'm really excited about it. I'm moving forward with it. And somebody that is involved in my life will say something that just brings down my entire mood. And I'm not able to pursue the thing that I want to do with the level of energy, with the level of joy that's going to enable me to be successful. To me, that's a red flag. Whatever that act or whatever that behavior is, if it continues to happen, it has become a momentum type of thing that's happening in your relationship. It's not just a moment. It's something that has built momentum. So it's important when we're kind of trying to determine red flags that we look at the impact of the behavior that we're, that we're you know, observing. Of course, one behavior could be it for us, but we want to pay attention to that momentum and make a decision from there. How do we balance between feelings of joy and justifiable feelings of anger, sadness, and disgust. I allow myself to have all of the emotions. I don't choose between them and I allow them to coexist. But I think the sweet spot for me is centering hope so I don't fall into despair and this terrible darkness because it's ugly out there. Uh, and I just surround myself with community and friends who get it and who get me. And I don't have to explain anything and that is life-giving. Though I have a shirt on today with a smiley face, um, one of the things that I think is, is uh, you know, really kind of risky is if we just kind of throw a smile on our face to cover anything that's happening. Now, I really love, 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 love Kirk Franklin's song, Smile. But every time I listen to it, I can't help but to think, is that going to solve everything? You know, smiling is wonderful, but have we really gotten to the root of what's going on so that we can have genuine joy and positivity throughout whatever it is we're experiencing. Now there is some research out there that talks about 
the impact physiologically that a smile can have on us when we are feeling down. That to just physically allow yourself to smile through a situation can actually help us in, in a physiological way to feel better. And that's great in the moment. And I think it's important for us to consider that as a great st strategy um, for you know comforting ourselves when we're not feeling well. But we cannot allow that to be the solution when we are genuinely struggling with something deep like depression or something that really needs a, an in-depth amount of care and attention. So how do we know if we are spiraling in a way that does need help and attention? What psychologists say is that we need to pay attention to how long we're feeling down. If we're feeling down consistently for around two weeks, then we really need to pay attention to that. Even if we implement some of these joy strategies and joy tactics um, to try to create and build our joy, it's important to understand that sometimes we do need help and that we can't do everything all the time by ourselves. And so when we find ourselves in a spiral that seems to be lasting a couple of weeks, then it's time to reach out and get help because part of the acquisition of joy is to be able to know when to ask for help, to know what strategies are going to need to work for any given situation. So it's important that we pay attention to the ways that we might try to psych ourselves out. Um, our society has not made it easy for us to feel sad or to feel down when somebody asks, how are you doing? And you're honest and you say, you know what? Today is kind of a rough day. Um, we haven't really created the kinds of interactions in our society that allow for answers like that. So what we do is we put on a smile and we say, I'm doing great. How are you? And that politically correct answer may serve to get you through that moment. But what happens when you're by yourself once again? Joy is power and this is today's Power Gear. Go to thejoywhisperer.org, visit the store, and get your joy gear today. Thank you for tuning in to this week's sneak peek episode of The Joy Whisperer. To join the conversation throughout the week, visit me on social media. Just search Pamela Larde on LinkedIn and Whispering Joy on Instagram. Also, visit our website at thejoywhisperer.org. Tune in on SSN TV via Roku every Thursday at noon Eastern time. We are also streaming next day at 3 p.m. on Sensation Station Network's Facebook page and my LinkedIn page. And one final word on red flags. Here's what Coach Penny Arrington had to say. As a general foundation, we want to give grace to things that are flagged, except for if it's burning. And so learning to really trust your instinct. And if it's burning, get out the house. And until next time, remember that joy is the best energy source for your resilience, your relationships, your restoration, and your resistance. Mm -hmm.